I am going to uh, entice you all to um, believe and be passionate about the early years as pivotal uh, for Canada's prosperity. So that is my objective this morning. I hope you enjoy what I have to say and I'm very much looking forward to your, uh, uh, to your questions which I understand you're going to have lots of uh, opportunities to write down. So as you've heard, I'm an infant uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist. I'm now a full professor at McMaster which is a, a rather wondrous event for me. <laughs> I'm a full professor. Particularly because my path has been very different. I know many of you are academics, uh, uh, previous, uh, well you're always an academic whether you're a previous one or not. Um, uh, but uh, my career really has been one that has, uh, has followed the leadership of some of my teachers who you see here uh, and mainly in the community in advocacy and education. Uh, so it's a, a real honour for me to now stand before so many of you who have built the careers and supported the careers of many of the young people who are going to continue this passionate work. So I always start dedicating my work uh, to Dan Offord, Fraser Mustard and Clyde Hertzman, all McMaster, uh, all McMaster people in one form or another. Many of you will remember uh, Dr. Fraser Mustard, he was my dean uh, at, uh, uh, at medical school. Uh, and he and Dan Offord, Dan Offord was the, um, the scientist who identified that there are one in five children in Canada, in Ontario, with a significant mental health disorder. Before Dan did his Ontario Child Health Survey, which is just now being repeated, we didn't really know how big an issue was children's mental health anywhere in the world, really. Um, and it was a Dan's work that put children's mental health on the map and really changed the dialogue. Well, he and Fraser, um, in, their, um, uh, in the last uh, decade or so of their life, became absolutely fascinated with what is it that makes some people healthy and others not. We know, and I'm sure in your series you hear about, the social determinants of health. But really what they landed on was what happens in the earliest years, is what builds the architecture of the brain, builds the physiology of the stress system and is in fact such a determinant of health that it needs to be addressed at the policy, the practice uh, and implementation research level. So I also bring along my dear friend Clyde Hertzman who was a resident here um, back in the days when I was a, when I was a resident. Uh, he was the leader in British Columbia once he left McMaster and he got fascinated by why is it that your postal code and your life experiences in early childhood leave a mark. Leave a mark such that if you have adversity in early childhood, you're more likely to have teen pregnancy, drop out of school. How is it that biology gets underneath the skin? So he, he coined the term biological embedding in the context of the early years. So I hope to touch on a whole bunch of different things today, including epigenetics, which uh, uh, Clyde introduced to us as a, um, uh, as a, as a concept in our, our group of thinkers around how can we make the world a better place for all of our children. So Clyde was involved with the World Health Organization um, in 2008, Sir Michael Marmot uh, is a big Sir, uh, doctor, Sir Professor, he's got lots of things that he has to say. And in 2008 he wrote a document uh, for the World Health Organization to look at the social determinants of health. Clyde um, led the writing of the chapter number five. It was chapter five that really pulled all of the research from an international perspective that showed that early childhood is so important because it is in fact laying the groundwork for much of what happens um, after, after that subsequent health, subsequent learning, uh, subsequent um, uh, behaviour is very, very much founded in what happens in the earliest years. And by the earliest years, I'm going to show you that what I'm talking about is prenatally 
up till at least six years of age. So the uh, Sir Michael Marmot report that I talked about, closing the gap in a generation, he is a man who does not need to mince words, nor does he by temperament, I think. And he says very clearly that it's poor social policies, unfair economics and bad politics that are killing people on a grand scale. So he looked at many, many countries. Uh, he looked at uh, the difference between life expectancy for a woman in Botswana, which is 45, compared to a woman in Japan, which is 80. So you might think, wow, what a difference in life expectancy. Is it different genes? Is it different, is it different um, uh, personal life choices? So then he started looking closer in and he, and he, looked, at, he looked at Glasgow, the centre of the universe. <laughs> of all cities <laughs> was that the life expectancy just a couple of miles apart between the well-to-do was 82 and it was 54 just a couple of uh, miles apart that's today in Glasgow so there was a 26 year difference so you might say, oh yeah, well we know all about those Glaswegians and they're drinking and all of that lot. <laughs> but does it have any relevance to us in Hamilton? And the answer is absolutely yes. You as an audience will know very well about the Code Red series that was done. And so what Code Red did was looked at data that's available and saw that there are different neighbourhoods where the likelihood of having a heart attack the likelihood of arriving at school without the skills you need to do well in that situation are hugely different. Even life expectancy, so my brother is a teacher in St. Bridget's School down in inner city Hamilton near the General. And so uh, uh, the difference between life expectancy where he is and where I am um, up, near, uh, up near Mohawk College is 21 years in Hamilton today. So we have to say, whose responsibility is it to address this issue? Now here we have, and uh, some of you know that I have in the past been on CHML, and um, there's always a phone call that comes in that says, you know, uh, they had those children, it's up to them to look after them, what have you, right? And so the question of, is whose responsibility? Is it family's responsibility or society's responsibility? And I stole this slide from a colleague, um, uh, Nora Lou Roos from the uh, Centre of Health Policy. So here we see a mother duck coming along, doing what a mother duck does, looking after her little ones, and she comes across a social condition over which she has no control. And what do we see? We see the loss of the ducklings. Now we have to ask ourselves, whose responsibility is it to make sure, and surely we will be saying that it's all of our responsibility. Now for those of you who are tender-hearted or sucks, as I would say. <laughs> Remember that they're little baby ducklings and it's a sewer, so they paddle off to the sea, right? <laughs> Somewhere that we're hoping is safe. But you know, we have to then ask ourselves, well, how is Canada doing? How is Canada looking after their children? Here we see how Canada is doing after they're looking after their children. This was a UNICEF report that came out looking at poverty and it showed that Canada uh, several years ago was doing very, very poorly. We were 17 out of 29 countries in terms of uh, kids living in poverty. We were 27 out of 29 in terms of mental health, 22nd out of 29 in terms of infants uh, and, uh, uh, and obesity. So you have to ask yourself, why are we not hearing about how Canada is doing? We are a very well-to-do country. What, how many of you heard of the UNICEF report card that came out several years ago? How many in this room knew about that report? Only a handful. How many of you heard about the report that came out two days ago? The UNICEF report card. Right. In this UNICEF report card that just came out, so this is the Innocenti, uh, Innocenti group in, uh, uh, in Florence, 
they look at the richest countries and they looked at 35 and 41 different countries depending on what markers they were looking at and they found that Canada looking at inequality between the children who are in the lowest uh, quintile and the middle and what they found that Canada ranks 26 out of 35 why were we watching Trudeau boxing yesterday instead of hearing about how Canada's children are doing? This is not a political uh, grouping issue or a party's issue. It needs to be without party affiliation that we stand up and say 25, 26 out of 35 is abysmal for Canadian children. That means that our children, their, their sense of life satisfaction, our Canadian children asked about life satisfaction is about 24th out of 35 countries. Our health inequities as well is very, very deep. We are Canada. This is modernity's paradox. Whereas a country, we've got a great standard of living, and yet we're leaving our children behind. Is this not the canary <coughs> in the minefield? So what we need to be doing is really, as citizens, asking ourselves, what can we do about this? One is ask, start asking for more coverage of what's going to happen about UNICEF. We have many, many things that we can worry about, but the nation that looks after its most vulnerable is the most civic nation. And I'm afraid that Canada is not ranking very well in that domain. So let's go down now to looking at what influences early child development. And what we see is that when you're addressing early child development, we're talking about all of the experiences that children have in the environments where they grow up, where they live and they learn. This particular slide here is one that uh, Clyde Hertzman and his group in the International uh, World Health Organization put together to show that it's a multi-system that raises our children, many, many layers, and there's a back and forth between each of the layers. At the center is the child who comes with his and her own temperament, her own vulnerabilities, her own strengths, his own capacities, that interacts with the family. The family is supported or not supported by the community in which they live. So for example, we know in Canada, we know in Ontario anyway, that about 76% of mothers and fathers with children under six are in the workforce. So 76% or thereabouts. We only have childcare spots, high quality perhaps, but childcare spots for 19% of those children. So who's asking? Who's looking after the freaking kids? <laughs> Who's looking after our kids? So we see then that the decisions that are made at a regional level really influence how well that family is able to earn the living because it's not that people are going out because they want their BMWs, it's because we now need two incomes in order to get what we used to get for one income. So we need both parents working, but we're not as a society saying, how are we making this happen? The region decisions are influenced by the country's decisions. Many of us were very thrilled when we saw the alignment with the, uh, the uh, before um, Prime Minister Harper, when we saw the alignment with, uh, with uh, 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 Prime Minister Martin, that we were going to have full, full uh, high quality support for parents and their children. But then that got suddenly changed with a new government. Now again, we're hopeful that this government is going to say when our children do well we all do well it's not just about supporting the families who have children but when we support the families who have children then we are building the workforce for tomorrow the workforce is going to be looking after us as we age and need to be looked after so at the heart of this, uh, and the heart of what Fraser Mustard and, uh, um, and Dan and Clyde talked about was the brain. What we've learned, the neuroscience, is what I want to talk about now. 
We used to think back in the olden days uh, that um, nature was more important than nurture. No, nurture was more important than nature. Is it nature or is it nurture? What is it that makes us who we are? Well, what we know is now is that it's nature interacting with nurture at different developmental times. So what we know is that experience quite literally builds the brain. So the baby's brain, when it's first born, has a um, hundred billion different neurons. That's what a brain cell is called, a neuron. I'm making this uh, very simple for accessibility. So we've got all of these billions of neurons, and they are not connected yet. They're in place as of about 20 weeks of gestation. So genetically, by a lot, the code has put them into their various places. But a baby's brain is only about one pound. By the time they are three years of age, their brain has almost tripled in size. <coughs> so a couple of things that you think about then is, well, what makes it triple? Well, it's the experiences that babies have, how much singing they hear, how much talking, how much soothing. So experience is absolutely everything that the child first experiences through the senses, then through nurturing. But the other thing is, if the brain is born, in fact, prematurely for its development, should we not be thinking of those first years like an external womb? That we are creating the environment in the first year that is such a, a delicate dance between building and supporting that we should be seriously thinking about it as an external womb. Well, in Canada, we're a, a step ahead of the U.S. because in the U.S., the average maternity leave is six weeks. In Canada, it's 12 months. But when you stop and look and see, do people realize that this is an external womb you're creating? And what we see is uh, baby buggies with the baby um, facing forward, with parents on their iPhone. You can now get um, a little, little walker things with a, a little slot for your tablet for the baby to go in. It's not, it's not malice, it's lack of knowledge. What it is that builds babies' brains is not baby Einstein, baby Beethoven, baby Tupac, baby, you know, Britney Spears is coming out soon, no doubt. It's the back and forth. It's the back and forth. The serve and return, the human face is what builds the baby's brain. The picking up, the rocking, the singing, the nursery rhymes, all of these things we now know is what builds the brain. Now here's a very practical example of this. This is a study which has been replicated that looks at how many words. So you've got the idea then that the brain is built, they've got all of these neurons in place, and when a stimulus comes in, it turns that neuron on to make a connection with other like-minded neurons, if you can call them like-minded. So one neuron can actually be in touch with 1,500 other neurons. So if a baby is talked to over and over and over again, those neurons reach out to each other, and it's kind of like Facebook. They make all kinds of interconnections, and you friend, I friend you, and I friend you, but you said something nasty, so I snip you away, I unfriend you. So what gets used over and over and over again is what literally sculpts the brain. So that means if you were to um, design an experiment to see does this make a difference in terms of language development, and this is the work of Hart and Risley, and what they did was they added up the number of words that children heard. In a, uh, uh, they would go in once a month and tape record everything and what they, what they discovered was that in welfare families the children heard about 13 million words, working class family heard about 26 million words and college educated families those kids heard about 43 million words. The first paper they called this the 30 million word gap. I want you to imagine this 30 million word gap as what is present today in Hamilton. 
that the differences in exposure to language that our little ones have coming from high stress neighborhoods is significantly less than it is. Now you might say, oh well let's do something for those poor kids, but in fact Studies have now shown that it's not poverty itself that is the issue, it's the quality of the parenting. It's how much does that parent, they've done studies of just poor families, and what they've shown is that the range is just as great in poor families. There are some poor families who talk, 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 talk. There are some rich families who don't talk at all. But in this original study, what they saw was that there was a very big difference between the actual language the kids developed relative to what they had heard. So the little kids who had only heard 13 million words, by the time they arrived at what would now be a full day of kindergarten in Ontario, they only had 400 words, compared to the kid who had 1,200 words, because their parents had talked, 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 talked to them. Now keep in mind, this is a parenting issue. Poverty makes it very much more complicated. But if you're a three-year-old, uh, three years, eight months, nine months, arriving in September, you only have 400 words, somebody knocks over your, uh, your toys, you're going to have a different response than someone with 1,200 words. Someone with 1,200 words say, I don't like that, that hurts my feelings. Whereas the other guy just kind of goes, what? Can we maybe some other choice words? So. Key concept, we now know that the literal architecture of the brain is sculpted by this early experience, that it is the quality of the interactions, the serve and return, the back and forth of daily drip, drip, drip interactions. So if you as grandparents and aunties and uncles want to do something with your little ones, give a book, give your time, play peekaboo, do not give an iPad or a leapfrog or any of those things. It's your face that baby craves and absolutely needs. So we've been trying in Ontario to get this message across to parents and what we know is that our family physicians and nurses see every single child under two before they start school. So we've introduced, or in the past um, uh, seven, eight years have introduced an enhanced 18 month well baby visit where we have uh, physicians and parents uh, completing uh, just questionnaires but giving a dialogue about the importance of reading to your baby, of picking up your baby's cues. Why? Because what we know is the more there's high pressure for that real estate and this is called brain plasticity, that the brain is plastic gets changed and molded by the experience. But the baby doesn't say, oh, this is a good experience, I'll keep it. Oh, no, no, this is a bad one, I don't want it. Whatever happens, the baby's brain is being altered by that experience. So what we know, this is the work of Bruce Perry, is use it or lose it. The brain cells that fire together, wire together. <laughs> So if they're the great cells of language and soothing, you learn to be soothed by being soothed by somebody else. But if you're not soothed by somebody else, if in fact you're neglected, not picked up when you cry, if you're in fact afraid of your caregiver, your brain is wired by that. I speak with judges across the country and I say, you know, babies' brains are not going on hold while you make your decision about who looks after them. Babies' brains don't go on hold, they're being affected. So one of the things that Dan wanted to look at, Dan offered, was how do we know how our children are doing? How do we know about how the early years have affected them? So he and Dr. Magdalena Janus here at the Offord Centre developed a tool called the Early Development Instrument. So you know Dan was an epidemiology um, a child psychiatrist, so he wanted to be able to measure. So we have no way of knowing how our children are doing unless we look at their report card. So, and that's way too late, obviously, if the brain is being built earlier. So he developed, along with Magdalena, this tool called the Early Development Instrument. Kindergarten teachers fill it out, 
at, um, uh, in the year, uh, in February or March, when they know the children really well. In Ontario, it's now uh, mandated, and we have uh, we have a uh, every single child in um, in kindergarten pretty well had the EDI done uh, last year. So what it does is it looks at physical well-being, communication, language, emotional, social competence. It looks at the child's development. It's just a checklist. It's not a screening tool. It's just a checklist that then gets aggregated up and you get numbers by population. So it is a population level measure, not an individual level measure. And what we find in Ontario is that about 27 to 30 percent of children are arriving at school right now without the skills to do well in that situation. 27 to 30 percent. And it's the same across Canada um, when you look at Australia, which also does the EDI, you see that this is a similar number. So we have to ask ourselves, is that good enough? The greatest percentage of children with um, vulnerability are in living in poverty. But look at where the greatest number is. The greatest number of children with vulnerability are in the middle class. Now, the thing about living in poverty is you can tell that somebody lives in poverty. The issue about living in the middle class is you can't. You can't tell that this child is vulnerable or that child is vulnerable. What this means is we need to have universal interventions that are uh, to, be, to be effective. Now, we have to ask then, all right, so... We know that children are arriving at school without the skills they need to do well there. We have a number of studies that link how the EDI is and grade three scores. And unfortunately, what we see is that where children come in too often is where they remain. So we have to ask ourselves, are we content as a community? In Hamilton, it's 30%. Are we content as a community to say that it's all right that 30% of our kids don't have the skills they need to do well there? It means that we need to focus our energies on supporting families in the early years. What happens in the early years has a very long reach. What happens when you look at life course problems that are related to early life? You see, when there has been adverse experiences in the earliest years, you have more school failure, more teen pregnancy, and more criminality. In fact, when I was visiting Tucson, they told me that they look at grade three reading scores to determine how many jail cells they're going to need in a decade. They call it the cradle to prison pipeline. So this tells us a lot. It's not that reading, not being able to read, is the issue. It's the, the issue is that not being able to read at grade three is a marker for what has gone before. It's a marker. So then when you look at the third and fourth decades, early experiences, obesity, elevated blood pressure, depression, the fifth and sixth decade, coronary heart disease and diabetes, uh, we don't call the next session old age anymore, do we? No. Uh, but you do see premature aging and, uh, and memory loss. So, life course problems that are related to what happened early. I want to tell you that it's not so that those, these results were from longitudinal studies. So Clyde was involved in the, um, uh, the 1958 British cohort study. So this is looking at people who were born in 1958 and measuring their well-being, their illness, their accomplishments over many years. And what he could see is that when he looked at that cohort at age seven, and he saw that the person was short for their adult height, as well as uh, had a poor math score. Clyde and his group could say, all right, I predict he has heart disease by 45. What? 
your height and math score has an influence at seven, has an influence on 45? Absolutely. Absolutely. So then another study that is now getting more light is called the Adverse Childhood Experiences. So this was two internists, uh, and an, epide an epidemiologist and an internist, uh, one at the CDC, Center for Disease Control, uh, and one at uh, San Diego Kaiser Permanente. So essentially, what those scientists, what those doctors did, is they, um, Felitti was doing an intervention on obesity, and he found that people were doing pretty well, and then they seemed to sabotage it. And he then got the idea that he would ask them uh, about their early experiences, what life had been like, and so many of them, he discovered, had histories of abuse. So, he and, um, and um, uh, Dr. Anda developed a 10-question questionnaire that they gave to 17,300 middle-class and upper um, uh, people, asking them, before the age of 18, did you experience emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, physical neglect, so any of these, just a yes or a no. What he found, what they found, they then followed these people for 10 or more years and looked at their health outcomes. What they found was that ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, are common. And what they found also was that the more you accumulated these adverse childhood experiences, the more likely you were to have a chronic medical condition. So they looked at risk factors for adult heart disease. And what they saw was that if you had four or more adverse childhood experiences, you were much more likely, two times more likely, to have a heart disease. You were much more likely to have um, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now many of you in our world of, um, of medicine know that we're spending tons of money now on uh, chronic disease management. And one of the things that we have to be saying is, how are we addressing the roots of chronic disease? And if we're not looking at what's happening in the very, very youngest years, then we're going to be missing, we're going to be continuing to be at the bottom of that cliff, catching people in our ambulances at the bottom rather than being <laughs> up on the top. I'm going to give you one of the theories that's at the heart of it, and it has to do with stress. When we see a bear, when we see, if we're walking home and we see a bear, we have a biological stress system that has kept us alive as a species. Now I do a talk on the adolescent brain which shows that his adolescent need for thrill seeking that's kept us alive as a species. But that's another whole talk, that mindset. But so when we see a bear, we have to have embedded in our physiological systems a way to respond to that. So we do. Uh, it's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Now it's a, a complicated <laughs> system. So what we have is when we sense something dangerous, deep inside our brain in our limbic system or deeper is an organ, one on each side, called the amygdala. It is the fight, flight, or freeze. So the amygdala, the amygdala sets off a series. It's a complicated um, a chemical thing that happens, but it sends down a signal to release eventually or very quickly. Uh, uh, gives a message to a little organ on top of the kidneys called the adrenals to release adrenaline. So that's like, oh, come on, get out of here. We have to be ready to run. It also sends a signal to another part of the adrenals to release cortisol. <coughs> now cortisol is our stress hormone, it's our friend. Cortisol is our friend because we need that cortisol acutely. Uh, we need it to get out of bed in the morning. It goes up and then it goes down. But the problem is we need to have a way of turning off the cortisol. Because if we have too much cortisol, if the system gets turned on but doesn't get turned off, our body gets bombarded, bombarded, bombarded. So we have a number of regulatory mechanisms, 
for the cortisol. Simplistically, one of them is called our hippocampus, which is our new learning and memory. So your hippocampus, we've got one on each side, it's shaped like a seahorse, that's why it's called the hippocampus. It's the hippocampus that is responsible for new learning and memory. How the hippocampus does it is a number of ways. It's new learning and memory. It has receptors on it for, um, uh, for glucocorticoids, and so it has a negative feedback loop. When they're saturated or when they reach a level, they turn off the signal, right? So the body likes homeostasis. That is, it likes a balance. So you get the threat, in comes the adrenaline, in comes the cortisol, the hippocampus says, hey, check it out, this is okay, it's not a bear, the bear's gone, and everything gets turned off. But what happens if you live in a world where the bear is always there? So when you're living in high poverty without buffering of relationships, many people who live in poverty are doing very well, thank you very much because they have the quality of relationships and support. Many people living in well-to-do families are not doing so well because they're socially isolated, even though they have much. But what happens when that bear is there all the time? You see, the effects of that high cortisol affects our prefrontal cortex, which is our planning, organizing, impulse inhibition, emotional control, Poor memory, difficulty focusing, critical thinking difficulty, increased anxiety and fear. So our system, the theory is, is that when we have systems where there is an overproduction of cortisol, that is setting the pathways for later disease. So what happens early is affecting how the pathways are actually evolving. We know this from studies when we look um, at uh, women who were abused. When you look at women who were abused and you look at their cortisol level, they have higher cortisol level. They have higher cortisol responses to adverse events. And we know that cortisol does many, many things at different levels, high levels, unremitting cortisol. One of the things that the scientists are now seeing is that the DNA has got little um, uh, pencil, rubber-like pencil extensions on the end of the DNA called telomeres. And what be, is now being seen is that high persistent stress eats away at those telomeres so that the DNA is not, as, um, is not as protected. So, let's go one layer more deeply and see what might be happening that the life of a child who is growing up on Gibson Street, downtown, is different than the life of a child living up on, uh, with a, a, a loving family, you know, the prototypical family. One of the areas, and this is the last concept I'll talk to you about, one of the areas that people are looking at is called epigenetics. Epigenetics <coughs> is alterations of the DNA, not to the base pairs. You know how the DNA's got these lovely base pairs. It's not to the base pairs themselves, but it's little messengers on top of epi, on top of the genes that tell the gene whether to be active or, whether, or to be silent, whether to make the protein or to be quiet. So when you think of the miracle of birth, and you think that it all starts with the cells from mom and dad, they have all the same DNA, how is it that the, some become skin cells, some become liver cells? It all starts from the same. Well, it has to do with the messages that the DNA has encoded in it, but it also has to do with the DNA having messages that are silenced. So in order to get, a, for example, with these um, butterflies, these are identical butterflies, genetically identical butterflies. So they have exactly the same DNA, exactly the same base pairs throughout. 
The difference is the yellow one is hatched in the wet season, the blue one is hatched in the dry season. What does that mean? It means that for, a, uh, uh, for survival, in order for this wet season um, butterfly to survive, its blue gene needs to be silenced. So they've got the same gene, but the yellow one has the blue expression silenced. Is that making sense? That's epigenetics. That's epigenetics. There's very famous studies looking at um, um, mice with an agouti gene, agouti, A-G-O-U-T-I, and what you see here very nicely is that they have the same DNA, but if you have the agouti gene and it gets expressed, you are yellow and fat as a mouse. Not a happy state to be. If you, however, have your agouti gene, the little green markers are called methyl groups and they silence the expression of the agouti gene. Making sense? Mm -hmm. So when there are methyl groups on particular aspects of the DNA, it silences it. So, if you are, this is your, these are identical, and this is just so that you don't know it's cartoons. These are actual little mice here, and they have the same DNA, but a methyl group was tied onto the DNA of the little brown mouse. How? By feeding the pregnant mum different things. Yes, the joy of kale. <laughs> so, let's bring it a little bit closer to home. So, who remembers the ice storm of 1998? Yeah, many of us. So, scientists have been looking at the babies born of the mums who were pregnant during that uh, period of time. Some of them had no electricity for 45, 54 days. So they are following those children and they're looking at different areas of the DNA, different parts of the DNA, and also looking, uh, looking at the health of the children. And what they are finding, so what they, how this is different is it's not just other reports that have looked at mum's stress during pregnancy have asked for mum's um, uh, uh, subjective report of her stress. This is one of the few studies that has an objective uh, marker, that there's no electricity during a very, very cold winter, right? So what they have seen with the ice storm babies, some of the first results, is that some of the babies who are now 13, 1998, or a, a bit older, the study that I read, uh, the, the children were 13, more children with asthma. That in fact, the methylation that they see occurring is in the immune system of the children who were born afterwards. Now some of you will, may also know of the studies that were done following uh, the Second World War of people who were born um, in Holland uh, during the Dutch famine when the Germans starved people in the villages. And what they have seen with those babies is that there's more incidences depending on what term of pregnancy the mother was that those babies have more schizophrenia, more asthma. So there is something that's happening in utero preparing for the next environment. So this idea of the DNA being affected, there are different ways that it can happen and one of them is methylation. So methylation is when a, a methyl group comes and sits on top of the DNA. When that happens, you don't have the expression of that gene. Now here's some of the very interesting things that are now being looked at, and that is the intergenerational transmission. There are some studies now coming out in rats and in mice that are looking at maternal, no sorry, paternal stressors. 
and finding that when there are, when the mice or rats are stressed by having the mother taken away from them, their sperm is altered. And that sperm alteration leads to more disease in the offspring. And they're now seeing that that is passed down through three generations. I want us now to think about what has happened in our residential schools with our First Nations people. And we know that there is epidemics of, um, uh, epidemic of uh, diabetes and other things in those First Nations uh, 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 cultures. And we know from all of this that it doesn't have to do with poor choices of, of, of uh, food or exercise, but it has to do with a very deeply ingrained biological changes that happened generations before. So here's the hope in all of this. When you have knowledge, you have access to treatment and you have access to thinking about ways the pathways can change. So you might think, well, if my DNA, you know, it was my grandmother that made me fat, you know, it's not enough. Or you can say, if I know that I am a young mum and that my number of aces is five, I'm going to make very sure that my baby's ace never gets be above one. That I know that these conditions can all twirl together like a cyclone and I'm going to bring that back. Or if we're working with adult people who have experienced trauma and many of the people that we can imagine um, uh, with high ACEs have experienced lots of trauma. When we have knowledge, then we have power to do something about it. Not necessarily easily, but there's a very large uh, study going on now in Alberta where in a primary care across the province, they're looking to see what is it that we can do to make sure that we make a difference in the lives of these people. So the last point here is the money point. And I leave the last point to be the money point because it doesn't sing in my heart as it may in others. But there are award-winning, Nobel Prize-winning economists who are telling us that we, when we invest in the early years, we get the best return on our investment than at any other time. So this is Jim Heckman that shows that investing before the uh, start of school, you get a much bigger return on your investment. In fact, at the White House um, um, study and presentation on the early years in December, the return on investment was calculated to be for every dollar you spend in the early years, you get over $8 back. It's a big return on investment. But for me, a more appealing story is to think about what the WHO has recommended. And it reminds me of a Cree story. The Cree honor their elders. And this elder is talking to the children and he says, you know, life is really hard. You have to make decisions all the time about what am I going to invest in, what am I not going to invest in, what's good for me, what's good for society. You know, it's like there's two wolves battling. Uh, one is kind and generous and loving and joyous. The other is mean and nasty and uh, angry all the time. And one of the little ones up front says, grandfather, tell me which one wins. He says it depends which one you feed the most. It depends which one you feed the most. I very much hope as we go into the break that you are going to be thinking a lot now about how can we feed our youngest families and children the most so that as a nation, Canada can in fact thrive and be where it should be at the top of that Innocenti report, not stuck below the, the last third. So I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful attention. Thank you.